So moving on to the last lecture of uh, the biogeochemistry and of the whole course. Um, so today we're going to be talking about, no, well, I'm going to be talking, you're going to be furiously writing down these nuggets of wisdom. Um, we're going to be talking about the sulfur cycle and how it's interrelated with some of the other cycles. Um, so sulfur is another one of these key nutrient elements that we kind of, um, we absolutely must have for life and function, okay? But it's also a really important for a whole bunch of other things to do with the environment as well. So it's a really important um, climate kind of relevant element, okay? So when you put uh, kind of lots of uh, sulfur up into the atmosphere, okay, hopefully you remember from the uh, climate part of the evolution of the thing, that leads to a, a global cooling that's quite short-lived. Uh, and it's quite anthropogenically uh, easily modified. Okay, so this is one of the elements that we're actually making quite large differences to, to the sulfur cycle, to the, to the cycle, so the sulfur cycle by things like uh, coal, so this is coal down here, we burn that, coal contains lots of sulfur, that goes up into the atmosphere and, and has uh, effects, okay? Um, uh, it's, also, um, it's also quite a smelly element, so this is um, hydrogen sulfide at the top, which is quite... Um, uh, uh, climatically relevant, biogeochemically relevant, but also smells. Um, so, yeah. so again, like with all of the other cycles we've done so far, we'll just go through introducing uh, where the sulphur is, how it moves around in between these different reservoirs, um, and then some of the how we'll talk about some of the kind of the, the implications of that for the biosphere, so life, and also nasty things like acid rain and whatnot. Okay, so, um, so sulfur is important. Uh, it's a really important part of quite a lot of proteins um, in, um, in, in, in cells, in biology. So this is one example. Uh, this is a cysteine, uh, which is quite a common, um, well, quite an important um, uh, amino acid. Um, and you can see it's got this sulfur hanging out on it there. Um, so other than being kind of really important for life, um, so without, uh, without amino acids, we wouldn't have things like DNA, which is kind of quite important. Um, it's, um, it's kind of environmentally quite important as well. So it's the, the main, sulfur in the atmosphere is the main constituent of acid rain. And kind of that's kind of bad in its own right, so we don't want kind of trees like this dying because, because of acid rain. But it's not just the acid that, that, that's killing these, these trees, uh, it's the impact of that acid on some of the other element cycles. Okay, so by changing, uh, by putting lots of acid on the soil, we change the pH, so we change the, the weathering regime, we might change also the availability of key pH dependent nutrients like phosphate. Okay, um, and, uh, and it's really important for cooling the climate through this um, uh, aerosol formation. So uh, we put lots of sulfur in the atmosphere, that creates lots of uh, sulfuric acid droplets, which act as cloud condensation nuclei. And we'll go through that um, later on. Okay. So um, I guess we went through tables like this for phosphorus and nitrogen. So this is one comparing sulfur with the phosphorus in the, in the, in the Earth system. So you can see that there is a small amount in the atmosphere. Kind of, there is no phosphorus in the atmosphere, but there's a small amount of sulfur, and that's these climate-relevant sulfur gases like sulfur dioxide um, and uh, sulfate aerosols, um, and some organic sulfur gases, which we'll come to. Um, but there's a huge, huge amount of sulfur in the ocean, okay? So unlike um, nitrogen and phosphorus, okay, so those are also quite concentrated in the ocean, but they're, they're quite depleted in particularly the surface ocean because biology uses up nitrogen and phosphorus, okay? Uh, so biology also uses up the, um, the sulfur, but it doesn't need as much of it as it does need phosphorus and nitrogen. So whenever biology is happening in the ocean, it always runs out of nitrogen and phosphorus before it runs out of sulfur, okay? And that's because sulfur is much more soluble in the ocean, okay, and there's more of it, so you don't run out of it. Um, and also the biological demand for sulfur is smaller compared to phosphorus and um, nitrogen. And because 
we don't run out of it in, in the Pacific Ocean. That means that it can accumulate in the ocean. It means it can have a, a much longer residence time than the phosphorus and nitrogen. Okay? So similarly to, to the other elements, there's a huge component in sedimentary rocks as well. And then um, some of the, the, the nutrient elements is kept in um, kind of the organic material. Okay, so just going now and looking at some of the chemical forms that we have. So sulfur has a huge variety of oxidation states that it can, can kind of like hang around in. So it can be in the um, oxidized forms of, of sulfate, okay? Uh, or it can be in the reduced forms of something like um, you know, the hydrogen sulfide. Okay, so it has a huge potential to be in lots and lots of different chemical forms which have got lots of different properties. So, um, so the top two are organic molecules, dimethyl sulfide and carbonyl sulfide. And these are important because they are, they are they basically are a flux out of the biosphere into the atmosphere. So whenever something kind of organic um, dies and decays, it tends to give off these sulfur gases. And these are uh, where sulfur is in the reduced form. Okay, so they ultimately lead to also the formation of things like hydrogen sulfide. Um, now, in the aqueous environment, um, Kind of natural waters are almost exclusively kind of oxygenated. Okay, so we have um, a predominance of um, sulfate ions. Okay, so this is a really, really very, very soluble form of sulfur. So that means that it can really start to accumulate in quite large volumes in the ocean, uh, large amounts, sorry, in the ocean. Um, and then looking into the, the lithosphere, there are, there are two kind of key forms of sulfur in the in this. There are, there's, uh, if you've got rocks that were formed uh, in the absence of oxygen, so deep sea, deep, blah, 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 deep sea, deep sea shales, um, or things like uh, volcanic rocks, which have got very, very low oxygen concentrations in, um, in dissolved in, in magmas, um, you tend to form iron sulfides, which is kind of pyrite, like this kind of like shiny thing here. Um, but if you have rocks that were formed in more oxygen-rich environments, okay, so um, uh, uh, shallow carbonates um, or maybe evaporite deposits, uh, you start to precipitate out this calcium sulfate, which is the oxidized form. Okay. Um, and the, the important thing about these, both of these minerals is that they are very easily weathered. Okay, so uh, gypsum effectively can dissolve in water. Okay. So if you just put water on it, you start to dissolve the calcium and sulfate back into the ocean. So this, this means that weathering of gypsum is that you have a, a large source of sulfate to the oceans. Okay, so this is another reason why the concentration is so high in the ocean. Um, pyrite um, is the uh, reduced form, and that oxidizes quite readily at the Earth's surface. So if you, if you go and find, you very rarely find pyrite in this kind of like nice shiny form. You usually see it as little rusty specks in rocks, okay, and that's because the iron is oxidizing and the sulfur is oxidizing, and that's releasing iron oxides and sulfate um, into the uh, environment, okay. And then the last um, kind of like box, our last reservoir of sulfur is kind of the biosphere, okay. So it's really, sulfur is really important constituent of proteins and amino acids. So it's, it's animals so store lots and lots of. Um, of proteins, lots of sulfur in animals. Okay, so we're going to start looking now at some of these fluxes um, of, uh, of sulfur in and out of different parts of the Earth system. So the main source is ultimately the weathering and erosion of rocks, okay, so of these pyrite and uh, gypsum uh, minerals, okay, so this, this gives 72 teragrams of sulfur a year, whatever that is, okay? So these are really easily weathered um, minerals, okay? So they, they weather into the ocean, they add calcium and they add sulfate to the ocean. Okay, so when you think about how we get stuff like, out of the ground or out of um, water into the atmosphere, okay? Because although there's loads and loads and loads of sulfur in the ocean, Okay, some of the really important climatic impacts of the sulfur cycle happen because sulfur gets up into the atmosphere. Okay, so, um, so these three, well, the, the top two there are um, hydrogen sulfide and sulfur dioxide. Those are both gases. Okay, so if you have something that forms 
those two chemical species, okay, that, those can really quite readily get up into the atmosphere. Um, the aerosols of sulphate, okay, so uh, sulphate is not really, it's not a gas as such, it quite often forms an aqueous iron. Okay, so actually there's so much sulphate in the ocean, okay, when you form sea spray, so when waves break and you get tiny little droplets of, um, of water, there's so much sulphur dissolved in those tiny little droplets of water so that when those get kind of blown up higher up into the atmosphere and over land, that actually is a significant component of the atmospheric kind of content of sulphur. And is a quite, a, quite, a, quite actually a large flux of um, aerosol from the ocean back to the land. Okay. Okay, so the other things uh, that, that have lots of sulphur in are dust, okay, because... Um, well, so uh, quite, this is, this is Africa, Canary Islands over there. So quite a lot of the surface rocks that are actually um, that are, uh, being weathered here, so eroded to form this dust, are former kind of dried up lake beds. Okay, I think Lake Chad is one of the, the main sources of dust. And these lake beds, they had a lot of gypsum deposits in them because uh, the sulphate was really, really soluble. When it weathered, it went into the lake. The lake dried out, left a kind of like a coating of kind of like calcium sulfate. So, a significant portion of this dust includes this calcium sulfate mineral. Okay, so you can see the dust being blown from here, from the land, out into the Atlantic Ocean. Okay, so that's a that's a significant flux. It's about ten times smaller than the weathering flux, but it is nonetheless important. Okay, and the next next plus flux is is basically from the biosphere. So any organic matter that's formed, okay, that's going to have some sulfur in it because that organic matter will have molecules like amino acids, DNA. Uh, if it's organic matter that's got lots of protein in it, like you know animals or beans, um, that uh, that's also going to contain sulfur gas. So in a, in a very simple way of thinking, of it, if you burn all of that organic matter, okay, that's going to oxidise the carbon, and you can see carbon oxidising here in this fire. But it's also going to start to oxidise some of that sulfur that's bound up in that organic material. Okay, so you're gonna um, start burning off um, uh, your, um, your sulfur as well into the atmosphere. So you're gonna, sulfur gases will be in this plume up here. Um, but it's not just, okay, so this is um, a pile of rotten vegetables, I think in Aspen, at a ski resort. It's kind of like the, 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 the waste you get at a you know, posh ski resort. Um, but that, the ski resort part is not really relevant. I just put this up because this is basically rotting organic matter. Okay? And if you've ever smelt rotting organic matter, okay, so either in your bin or technically in your stomach, um, it gives off a really nasty smell, right? Okay, if you go, go home and smell your bin, okay, it'll just don't do that. Uh, but some of that smell is due to these two molecules at the top. So the one on the left is um, uh, dimethyl sulfide which is quite smelly, and the other one is carbonyl sulfide. Okay, so uh, these two molecules um, are some of the, there are other sulfur species that are given off as well, but these are, these are the, the main two guys. Um, uh, so they're, they're gaseous, um, they um, are of the reduced form, so they can break down into hydrogen sulfide as well, which also smells of rotten vegetables or rotten eggs. Um, and that gives off these, these gases into the atmosphere. Okay, and it's not just kind of rotting vegetation on land. Um, this is a, a phytoplankton bloom off the south coast of England, and all that organic matter that's been produced in the ocean will ultimately decay and break down. And as it does that, it will give off these gaseous molecules, which will then diffuse back up into the atmosphere. Okay, so this is. Um, the importance of that. So these gaseous sulfur molecules, okay, they don't just stay as dimethyl sulfide or carbonyl sulfide. Those molecules are really, really unstable in an oxygen-rich atmosphere. Okay, so they break down um, and oxidize ultimately to sulfur dioxide and sulfate aerosols. Okay, and that has, you see, this is a, this is actually a volcanic eruption here. That has the effect. I say volcanic eruptions are also a source of sulfur to the atmosphere, which I guess you should know from the climate. 
um, side of things. But when these sulfates get up into the atmosphere, whether they're from volcanoes or whether they're from the breakdown of uh, organic material, that makes them kind of climatically active. So they act to cool the climate. Okay, because we, we start to um, nucleate more clouds, whiter clouds, clouds that last for longer. Okay, so these are volcanic emissions of sulfur down here as well. So this, these gases that are giving off are climatically kind of relevant, and they also um, will add to the acidity of the atmosphere. Okay, so um, these are, I guess these are two examples. I think these are, uh, yeah, so these are uh, eruptions in Indonesia, and yeah, I think they're both in Indonesia. Pinatubo? Pinatubo is in the Philippines. There you go. Anyway, two large eruptions. Um, so one in 1815 and the other one in 1991. Uh, and these are models of the sulfur loading in the atmosphere from those eruptions. Okay, so these are not actual measurements because... Um, oh no, these are measurements. Sorry, these are measurements. So these are measurements of the basically looking down from a satellite to see how much uh, radiation has been absorbed by the sulfur, um, sulfur dioxide. Um, so we can see that the eruption went off uh, in um, June the 15th in the Philippines over there, and we got this huge plume of uh, basically volcanic gases, which are basically locally acting to nucleate more clouds. Okay? And this effect lasted um, a couple of days here, but ultimately this plume made it all the way around the Earth, um, and was about 10 teragrams per year of sulfur. So compared to the uh, average uh, kind of flux from sort of the total Earth from dust, which was about 8 teragrams per year, so a single large eruption can kind of almost double the flux to the atmosphere, okay, from the lithosphere. Okay, so this is a, these are potentially very, very large events, and larger eruptions in the past have given out much, much, much more, so they have much bigger, longer-lasting effects. So these are um, kind of averaging out these kind of sporadic, so you don't get a massive volcanic eruption every year, uh, but they kind of even out, and you've got like maybe five teragrams per year from volcanoes on land, another five from volcanoes that are in the ocean, Okay, so this, this flux may not actually make it up into the atmosphere, may, some of it may stay in the ocean depending on how close to the surface of the ocean the volcano was. Okay? Uh, we've got this dust flux, which is um, just these mineral grains, mostly gypsum, being blown up into the atmosphere. Um, and then we've got these biogenic gases. Okay, we haven't drawn them on here, but there's biogenic gases from the breakdown of organic matter on land, but also the breakdown of organic matter in the ocean. Okay? And once this stuff is up in the atmosphere, it can, it can basically move around between the atmosphere and the ocean and then be deposited back down again, either uh, by being kind of reacting with water, forming sulfuric acid and then raining out, okay? Or dry deposition, which is kind of just when the particles of dust fall out of the, the, the sky and coat the land with dust. Okay, so um, just looking now at how we've... Um, I've altered some of these fluxes. So you can see here, this is time. This is uh, 1800 uh, to the year 2000. Okay, measurements kind of stop with this graph about 19, um, 1990. Uh, and what we're looking at here is we're looking at some of the um, uh, some of the the ions that are found in an ice core. Okay, so uh, so some of these things, so sulfate. And nitrate, these things are in the atmosphere as aerosols, and over time those will kind of like start to precipitate out as, as kind of clouds form and it starts raining, or in this case it starts snowing. So the actual water ice that is falling out of the atmosphere will actually contain dissolved in it um, some of this sulfate and nitrate. And you can kind of see in the pre industrial area, we were kind of over here, and as we industrialized, we're increasing the concentration of these things in the atmosphere. So over the last hundred years, you can kind of see we've kind of doubled or tripled the concentration of sulfur in the atmosphere and also the concentration of nitrates in the atmosphere. And the sources of this is, comp is almost entirely from fossil fuel burning. Okay? So this, these are kind of quite noisy signals, so that you can see maybe you know, there's a big spike in maybe early 1990s, which is probably that Mount Pinatubo eruption. 
but the, the long kind of like multi-decadal kind of hundred or so year trend is due to us burning fossil fuels. And the type of fossil fuels that we burn kind of determines also how much sulfur goes into the atmosphere. So this is why it's a lot better to burn natural gas because that's got a much lower sulfur content than it is to burn coal or even worse, kind of like um, tar sands or something like that, which have got huge sulfur contents. Okay? Um, and, that will, and that is why the atmosphere has acidified. Okay, so this is this, uh, this additional flux here. Okay, you can see the kind of magnitude of this kind of thing. So the flux to the atmosphere okay, is almost now entirely dominated by our anthropogenic emissions of sulfur. Okay, it's now kind of a similar magnitude to the, to the, the weathering flux, okay, which, was the, which was very large to start with. Okay, so the, um, this kind of like uh, increased emissions into the atmosphere, okay, we're putting all this sulfur into the atmosphere, but it doesn't stay in the atmosphere because the residence time of sulfur in the atmosphere is only maybe a few years. So a lot of this stuff we put into the atmosphere returns back to the land or the ocean as acid rain or as dry deposition. Okay, so that ultimately will make its way to increase the river flux of sulfur as well. So um, our anthropogenic activities of this um, fossil fuel burning has even altered the weathering flux of sulfur globally, which is remarkable given that it's such a, it was such a huge thing to start off with. Okay, it was such a soluble and easy weatherable um, element. Okay, so this is the, the, that, that point that the, most of the stuff we put up into the atmosphere has come straight back down. Okay, which is kind of good because if it had stayed up there, okay, well actually if it had stayed up there that would have solved our global warming problem. Okay, because if we, if we make the atmosphere very, very sulfur rich, we'll have lots and lots of cloud condensation nuclei, we'll, we'll reflect um, all of the solar radiation back out into space. Uh, and the planet wouldn't have warmed. Okay, and this kind of happened in the 70s, okay, when we were burning lots and lots of really nasty coal and stuff like that, especially in Europe. And that kind of did offset global warming a little bit in the 70s. And then we cleaned up our act and stopped burning all the sulfurous uh, uh, fossil fuels, and then global warming took off again. Okay, so it's actually one of the, one of the ideas for, for geoengineering the Earth's climate, so to, to kind of solve our CO2 problem, one of the things we could do is pump all of this, uh, carry on pumping sulfur up into the atmosphere to try and reflect stuff out to space. Okay. So we went over that briefly in the, in the climate lecture series, and that's kind of, kind of a, a bad idea. Um, but it, it might happen. Certainly. Okay, so to conclude, um, the, uh, the land cycle, uh, we have uh, this huge kind of flux of sulfur from the land to the atmosphere um, due to us mining out fossil fuels and burning them, okay? Uh, but then most of that comes back down again um, in the form of, of acid rain. Um, and then the key thing about the sulfur cycle is the sulfur, once it's oxidized, is really, really super soluble, okay? So it gets washed off the land, um, it gets washed into the ocean, okay? Um, and that's why the ocean concentration is so high. Um, and then the other important thing is that the anthropogenic activities have really massively changed the sulfur cycle in terms of adding this extra sulfur into the atmosphere, which comes back down onto the land. Okay, so moving now into the ocean. Okay, so we've got all these fluxes kind of constrained from the land. So we've got this really high flux from rivers, okay, which would have been a high flux naturally, but now it's kind of, uh, kind of almost double what it would be. And then we also have a flux from the land to the ocean in the form of these uh, atmospheric transport. So this is basically us, as this, this flux would exist without all of the fossil fuel burning, but it would be much smaller. Okay, so we're putting lots of sulfur into the atmosphere, mostly from fossil fuel burning, but also from volcanoes on land, from dust, from biogenic emissions from forests, things like that. So that's going up into the atmosphere and is being blown over the ocean. Uh, and ultimately, it will rain out. Okay, so some of that will rain out of the land, some of it will rain out of the ocean. But there's a net transport of this, this sulfur to the ocean, and that's largely because there's so much more sulfur being put into the atmosphere due to anthropogenic emissions over land. Okay, so we've got these two sources of sulfur to the ocean. 
Okay, um, and because the um, because the content because the, the fluxes of sulphur are so high, both naturally and anthropogenically, and the, actually the biological demand for sulphur is quite low in the ocean. So it's similar to the demand for phosphorus. So first, 106 carbons. We only need about one and a half to two and a half sulphurs. Okay. So that means we don't need much of it, and there already is a lot of it available in the ocean. So whenever biology kind of does its thing in the surface ocean, okay, it might. So this is uh, these are kind of depth profiles of, um, of, of nutrients like nitrogen, phosphorus, silicon at the top, um, carbon, and then these kind of bioinert elements. So they're not they're called bioinert, but they're not kind of not completely um, abiotic. So that life does need these elements. And sulfur is one of these. So in the surface ocean, okay, organisms will start growing because there's light and there are nutrients there. They'll take up sulfur, okay, but because the concentration is so high, okay, they don't really deplete the concentration significantly. So they might change it by kind of like a tiny amount. Okay? And the reason they don't deplete it is because the amount of biology that can happen is limited by the other nutrients. Okay? So life kind of starts to deplete the amount of sulfur in the ocean, but then it stops because it's run out of either phosphorus or nitrate or something like that. Okay? Which means that we never deplete the surface ocean in terms of sulfate, which means that it can carry on accumulating sulfate because it's a very soluble element and we're constantly adding more from the... Um, from river runoff and atmospheric deposition. Okay, so this means that the concentration is very high, the flux in is also high, but the concentration is so high that when we divide by the, the flux into the oceans, we end up with a very, very long residence time. Okay, so we end up with this 100 million year residence time. So that means if we stopped the flux of sulfur into the ocean, okay, and we just had the removal terms from biological removal and evaporite formation, it would take 10 million years for the concentration to reduce by half. Okay, so the concentration is not going to change dramatically through time because we're not going to suddenly shut off the weathering cycle. Okay, and it also means that the concentration of, um, of sulfur relative to these other bio elements will remain constant everywhere in the ocean. Okay, so that's kind of important, which means the ocean will never run out of sulfur. So we'll always have sulfur available in the ocean to do whatever we want with it. Okay, so we, we just like, uh, just on the land, go through some of these sources. We have uh, this uh, uh, volcanic flux. Uh, we have this biogenic gas flux. Okay, so this is the organic matter breaking down, releasing dimethyl sulfide and carbonyl sulfide. Okay, and those two gases are quite important because they oxidize very quickly in the atmosphere. Okay, and once they get out of the atmosphere and oxidize, they act as cloud condensation nuclei. And this is really important because over the land, okay, if you're trying to form a cloud over the land, the atmosphere over land is quite conducive to forming clouds because you get lots of vertical mo mo motion because of differential kind of heating in the land. You also get lots of dust from the land. Okay, so you get lots of other cloud condensation nuclei over the land. But in the ocean, the ocean is a really long way from, any, from the land. So regions of the ocean that are very, very far away from sources of these cloud condensation nuclei tend to be more cloud-free. So if we can produce these biogenic gases of sulfur, we can add a local source of cloud condensation nuclei so we can start to make the ocean more cloudy. And this is what makes a big deal because the ocean is a very dark colour and clouds are a very light colour. So forming clouds over the ocean is climatically more important than forming clouds over the land. Okay. Um, so this is the uh, this is this is this is this kind of the one of these molecules, dimethyl sulfide. Um, in the ocean, it's mostly due to the breakdown of phytoplankton, so kind of the primary algae that that grows from kind of from sunlight. Um, when that breaks down. Uh, it, it basically releases um, its nutrients into the ocean, it releases carbon back into the ocean, but the sulphur tends to be released back as either this dimethyl sulphide or this carbonyl sulphide. Okay, and a small fraction of that, because if you then have, this is a gas, if you have a gas dissolved in a liquid with an atmosphere above it, 
Because of Henry's law, some of that gas will diffuse up into the atmosphere until the concentration in the atmosphere is equal to the solubility times the solubility constant in the ocean. Okay? So once it gets up into the atmosphere, we have this molecule here, which is the carbonyl sulfide. No, sorry, this is the dimethyl sulfide. Is that molecule itself? sulfide? That oxidizes, okay, so we oxidize all of the chemicals in that to form sulfur dioxide. And then the sulfur dioxide kind of is oxidized by OH uh, radicals, which forms this sulfate aerosol, okay, which is sulfate will kind of like react with kind of water to form uh, sulfuric acid, which has got a very, very high boiling point, which means it condenses to very small liquid droplets, which act as these cloud condensation nuclei. Okay, and this is important because of, uh, because of the climate impact of these, these sulfate aerosols. Okay, so this is an example from the volcano. The volcano gives off sulfates, okay, and those seed clouds. Okay, so we get more clouds. And you get the same kind of thing over the ocean. So um, this is, uh, I'll just go on to the next slide, I think. Okay, so this is the claw hypothesis. Okay, this was a... Um, uh, basically a scientific hypothesis was brought, uh, suggested by these four authors, Charleston, Lovelock, uh, Andre, and um, uh, Warren. I've highlighted the wrong uh, letters in their names, but you can see that they're, that's why it's called the claw hypothesis. Okay, um, so James Lovelock is the author of um, basically the Gaia hypothesis, which is kind of not really a proper scientific hypothesis, but it's the idea that the, the Earth as a system will always kind of, kind of essentially operate as a, you can consider the earth as a living being, okay, which kind of made quite a lot of people think he was a bit of a nutter. But the earth will always kind of maintain itself to sustain life. So if you kind of start to make the planet too hot to have life, the planet will do something. There'll be some kind of feedback which works against that to keep the planet in this kind of habitable zone. Okay, and this was kind of one of these, this claw hypothesis was one of these mechanisms by which if you, if you warm the planet, okay, you might start to make more plankton grow, okay, because in, in warmer kind of environments, things grow faster. If you enhance phytoplankton growth, that means that you'll have more organic material that's going to ultimately be decaying, okay, which will produce more of this dimethyl sulfide, oxidizes to uh, sulfuric acid, which then acts as a cloud condensation nucleus, which acts against the initial warming. So this is a negative feedback, okay? Initial warming, stuff what happens to the Earth system, uh, in this case, biological growth and dimethyl sulfide production, and then formation of more clouds, acts to cool the planet, which is against the initial warming, okay? So that was, that was one kind of, kind of view of the system. But then uh, James Lovelock came along again a little bit later with the anti-claw hypothesis uh, in, in a book uh, titled The Revenge of Gaia, which was uh, exactly the same system. Okay? But if you kind of just think about what the initial effects of warming might be, it might have a completely different outcome. So in this case, you might have an initial global warming by us you know, putting loads of CO2 in the atmosphere. Okay? That would warm the ocean. Okay? All pretty straightforward. But then the idea is that actually a warmer ocean might lead to less biological activity. Okay? And the idea here is that if you warm the ocean, that makes the surface layer of the ocean hotter, more buoyant, okay? less, less dense. So it makes it harder to mix with the dense ocean underneath. Okay? And you remember from the previous two lectures that the, the, one of the main sources of nutrients to the surface ocean is that internal cycling from the deep ocean bringing upwelled water into the shallow ocean. So if you make the surface ocean hotter and more buoyant, you reduce that mixing between the two layers of the ocean. That would decrease the amount of phytoplankton growth. That means you get less DMS production, you get less uh, sulfate um, aerosol production, you get fewer clouds. Okay? So that would be a positive reinforcement cycle because if you had fewer clouds, you'd have more warming. Okay? So it's the, the same kind of system here which is whether it ends up being a positive feedback or a negative feedback depends on how well we understand how the Earth will respond to warming. Will it just be a simple, things get hotter, therefore reactions go faster? Or will it be actually things get hotter, so we change the dynamics of ocean mixing? 
Okay, so these, the, both of these effects will happen, okay? It's just whether this overall is a positive effect or a negative effect depends on whether this outcompetes the, the reaction rate thing. Okay, so that's just a kind of like a nice example of, of, of how kind of like scientific hypotheses kind of develop through time. We come up with our hypothesis, then someone comes up with another one, uh, and then that leads to us trying to want to try and kind of understand the system a little bit more. Okay, the claw, yes. So it's just a, those that are the story too. Um, uh, where are we now? Okay, so that, uh, yeah, so these um, other emissions from the land, from the ocean, are these sea salts, which I was mentioning earlier. Because the concentration of salt in the ocean is so high, okay, that the, when you actually form sea spray, that's, an act, that's quite a significant component of the sulfur flux of the atmosphere. Kind of also, it's quite interesting that the, the, the sea salt flux is quite a lot higher than the biogenic gas flux. So maybe that claw hypothesis of these biogenic gases being important, okay, maybe they're not so important because we've got such a high flux of sulfur um, or sulfate in particular from sea spray anyway. So maybe we need to look at changes in storminess rather than just changes in temperature. If it gets stormier, we might get more sea salt up into the atmosphere. Okay, that would mean more um, cloud condensation nuclei would mean a, a global cooling which might reduce the amount of storminess. Okay, so it's, an, it's just another kind of like take on, the, on the, the, the potential feedback mechanisms of the sulfur cycle. Okay, so all of that stuff that goes up into the atmosphere must come back down again at some point. Um, it's just re redeposited in the oceans, but because the ocean concentration is so high, it doesn't really um, make such a difference. Um, yeah, so the ultimate outflux, okay, are uh, um, uh, formation of uh, iron um, pyrite, so uh, FeS. Uh, so these, these are, um, uh, occur in places in the ocean where there's an absence of oxygen, okay? So places like the Black Sea, okay, the, the deep Black Sea, um, there's no oxygen in that, so this mineral is precipitating out of the ocean, and that's removing um, removing sulfur from the ocean. You also get sulfides forming as seawater circulates through um, uh, hydrothermal systems, so hot rocks. Okay, that will also remove sulfur from the system. Um, and ultimately, that this balance of the inputs and outputs is roughly, roughly imbalanced, but because we've increased our anthropogenic emissions, we're currently kind of out of balance. But that doesn't really affect the concentration of sulfur in the ocean because the residence time is so long. Because this, the, the current stock of sulfur in the ocean is so large, changes in the flux, okay, even doubling the input flux, doesn't have a very large impact on the output flux. Okay? Or doesn't have a very large impact on the concentration because the concentration is so high. So it's kind of like if you've got, uh, if you've got a bucket of salt water and you drink it and you think, oh, that's not salty enough. If you add like a, a few teaspoons more salt into that, it's not going to make much difference to the saltiness of the water. Okay? If you've already got lots of the things dissolved in your bucket already, adding a little bit more, it's still going to be quite a high concentration. Okay, so, um, so to summarize, so in the ocean, sulfur behaves like a conservative element. Okay, so its concentrations doesn't really change. Uh, sometimes referred to as bioinert, Okay, and that's not that it's not important for biology, but biology doesn't really affect its concentration in the ocean. Okay, so the bioinertness only really works one way. Okay, so uh, sulfur is not affected biology by biology, but biology is uh, dependent on sulfur. Okay, um, the main sources are from rivers and atmospheric deposition, um, and this biogenic uh, dimethyl sulfide uh, is potentially quite important. Um, for controlling or me mediating uh, the Earth's climate. Um, but it might not be the whole picture because you also have sulfur coming out of the ocean in sea spray. Um, and it turns out that most of the stuff that comes out of the ocean makes its way back into the ocean because the residence time in the atmosphere for these sulfur species is very short. Okay, that's because they oxidize these sulfate aerosols which react with water to form acid rain, which then falls back in the ocean. So the residence time in the atmosphere is very short, okay, and the ocean, it's very, very long. 
Okay, so um, so the, the, just some, some points about the biosphere. So again, just to reiterate, um, sulfur is an important thing for things like amino acids. Um, it's also, it can be used for, as, a, as an electron acceptor for, um, for respiration. So remember how when we talk about nitrogen, okay, when you've, when you're, if you're in an environment where you've used up, where organic matter is decaying and has used up all of the oxygen, okay, the bacteria starts to breathe nitrate and convert nitrate into nitrous oxide. Okay, it's less energy efficient, but if you've got no oxygen, that's the only game in town. Turns out that you can also do the same thing with sulfur. Okay, so if you've got um, some uh, kind of sulfur, either sulfate or sulfur dioxide, in the environment, and you've got some organic matter, and you've run out of all of the other things that you can use to oxidise that organic matter, okay, there are some bacteria um, that are called sulfur-reducing bacteria that can actually turn the sulfate into hydrogen sulfide and use that as an energy source to, to respire their organic matter. So this is uh, important in um, deep sea sediments uh, and in sediments which have been kind of, uh, in very kind of like stagnant water. You can start to produce um, uh, lots of hydrogen sulfide in, in sediments. Um, and actually, there, I think there, you might be able to see this going on in the, um, in the Ashworth labs. If you walk past the Ashworth labs and look in, you'll see there are loads of kind of sediment columns all along the window. Okay, and those are experiments where they're basically um, isolating the bottom bit from light, okay, and then put some organic matter in, in, the, in, the, in the sediment, and it starts out by starting to oxidise that organic matter with the oxygen that was in the water, the oxygen goes away, then it starts to use any nitrate in the water to oxidise the organic matter, and eventually it gets down to the sulphate, and it starts oxidising the organic matter that's in the sediment with sulphate, okay, and that produces CO2, that's the oxidised organic matter, and hydrogen sulphide. Okay. Now this is important because that hydrogen sulfide is a gas and it can escape up out of the sediment into the water column above. Um, it's very toxic, okay, so it can be bad to aquatic life, all that kind of things. Um, once it also gets up into the atmosphere, it can have a climatic impact on the atmosphere as well. Okay. Um, and this is just, uh, just uh, this is, there are a lot of equations here, uh, but the ones to kind of focus in on and this oxidation of organic matter at the top here, so that uses, that's the most energy efficient. You take organic matter, so CH2O is kind of an approximation of organic matter. You take oxygen, and that oxidizes the organic matter to CO2. Okay? Um, now, if you run out of oxygen, then you can kind of do the next one. And in most kind of aqueous environments, you have some nitrates available, particularly in the ocean. And you can take your organic matter, you can take your nitrates, and that ultimately reduces um, your nitrate to nitrogen gas, or you might only reduce it to an intermediate stage of nitrous oxide, but ultimately it'll get to that guy. So that's, that's quite good, that can use up, that can provide the organisms with some energy. But if you run out of nitrate, then you have to kind of work your way down this list, okay, until you eventually get to sulphate reduction, where you take organic matter, you take the sulphate ions, you can then form, for instance, well, in this case, Bicarbonate, which would ultimately, you know, equilibrate with the, with the water, um, and the CO2 and, and carbonate system, and um, hydrogen sulfide. So, if you look at a, a sediment, okay, so this is a kind of a schematic of looking. This is maybe some water overlying some sediment. If you kind of measure the concentration of all of these chemicals down in the sediment, you get this really quite characteristic set of profiles. Where at the surface, okay, you might have lots of organic matter. And then as that sediment's been accumulating, the organic matter has been decaying. So the older sediment at the bottom has got less organic matter. Okay? And that started out being oxidized by oxygen. Okay? So the surface sediment would have quite high oxygen because it's kind of in contact with the oxygenated water above. And as you go down into the sediment core, more of that oxygen is used up by oxidizing the organic matter until you get to a point where you've used it up completely. Okay? You might start oxidizing nitrate, okay, producing ammonia. Um, and once you've got rid of all of the oxygen, you can actually start to do this sulfate reduction process. So in kind of deep um, sediments, 
So away from the surface of, of the, when it's contact with the water, you can build up in quite high concentrations of hydrogen sulfide, ammonia, these really quite, well, toxic gases, which if these get out into the water column, this would be very bad for the environment. Um, yeah, so this is, this is so this, these are processes that happen in the absence of oxygen. So we have emissions of hydrogen sulfide from the wetlands, which is the word that I couldn't remember last time. So these are the places kind of cover much of kind of um, uh, northern Russia, Canada, Scotland. These are places where we have lots of standing stagnant water. Okay, um, and these emissions get immediately oxidised when they get into the atmosphere to, to SO2, uh, uh, which lead ultimately to acid rain. So if we have um, lots and lots of wetlands, lots and lots of boggy environments, lots of um, rice, rice paddies, they can in fact add to the acid rain problem. Okay, so it's not just the burning of fossil fuels. So if you burn fossil fuels, the fossil fuel will have some sulfur in, you burn it, you're oxidising it to SO2, that will lead to acid rain. Okay, but it's not just kind of like the bad guys burning fossil fuels, you also get acid rain from um, wetland production. Okay, so um, I guess this kind of concludes the whole uh, description of the sulfur cycle. Um, I'll let you kind of read that through your own time. But the important thing is that we've really uh, altered it quite massively with our own anthropogenic activities. Okay, and typically adding sulfur to the atmosphere has this cooling effect, and that because because of volcanoes or these biogenic emissions. But the cooling effect is through this action of aerosols and cloud formation. Okay? And then just lastly, we'll just talk about acid rain. Okay, so this is the, uh, we can look at the, the cooling effect, sorry, first. So this is looking at different, different types or different aspects of global warming. So you can see that the radiative forcing, how much the plants got warmer, it's mostly because of CO2. Um, ozone in the tropics also has a little small warming effect. Um, but if you look at the aerosol kind of effects, Okay, aerosols are a cooling effect on the climate, okay? although we don't, we don't have a very high confidence as to what the actual effect of that is. Um, so yeah, acid rain. So this, this is this, once we put the sulfur in the atmosphere, it reacts with water, and it starts to rain back out again. Okay, and this is the, um, so this is kind of our, kind of historic emissions of, of sulfur, so you can see 1800s, 1950, 2000, we kind of peaked our emissions in the 70s, okay? Um, and the, uh, at that time that we've had the most sulfur in the atmosphere, okay? You can see that the, the amount of sulfur in the atmosphere is changing quite a lot. Um, so, and quite rapidly, and that's because it's got a very short residence time, okay? So this, this, this amount of sulfur in the atmosphere has the effect of, of lowering the pH, because we're adding all of this, this basically sulfuric acid, okay, and this has the effect of kind of doing acid rain. So this is a, a limestone statue um, from somewhere in Germany, and you can see at the beginning of the century, uh, you could see the face of the statue, but by the beginning of the 70s, the statue was almost completely dissolved away, okay, and this is just the, the action of the basically sulfur that's being burned in Western Europe, particularly in the UK, and that's just going over onto Germany and raining out as acid. It's not just dissolving stuff. So this is the same, this is basically a map of the pH of rainfall, so you can see the pH is really, really low over Central Europe and Scandinavia. And this is because of emissions in kind of Western Europe of sulfate. It goes up into the atmosphere and then starts to rain out. Um, so it's not just that it's acid, um, it's uh, it interacts with some of the other cycles, okay? So if we have ammonia in our environment, either it's a gas or it's ammonium ion, that will react with sulfuric acid to form ammonium sulfate. So that's kind of good, that neutralizes the acid, that's great. It also removes some nutrient, which is kind of annoying, okay? Um, but it does at least put it in a form that that nutrient could be maybe used again somewhere else. Um, but if you look at the phosphorus cycle, if we start we have kind of like natural waters around pH 6 or 7, quite a lot of the phosphorus is available. Okay, it's usable by, by animals and that kind of stuff, or plants, sorry. But if we acidify 
the rainfall. When that falls on the land, if, it, if that lowers the pH of the soil to kind of um, four or four and a half or something like that, that massively reduces the pool of available phosphorus. Okay, so that means that one of the one of the main reasons why acid rain was so bad for kind of agriculture and forests over much of Europe, the trees didn't really die because they had acid landing on them. They died because they lost their available phosphorus. Okay, so they weren't uh, able to get enough nutrients to grow because the soil was acidified and that reduced the availability of phosphorus because the phosphorus then started to be locked up with all these iron and aluminium oxides. Okay, so you can see that, that it's, you can't just consider the effect of, of, of each of these element cycles on its own. You have to look at the links between them. Um, so the, the other obvious link is that um, weathering um, produces hydrogen sulfide, okay, um, and if you weather, if you increase the weathering flux, you basically have this really strong positive feedback, because the more sulfate you weather, the more sulfuric acid will be in your groundwater, the more, uh, or river water, and the more weathering that, that water will do onto other rocks, okay, so it makes everything. Um, now, you don't have to go into all the details of this, but this is just to show that, that all of these kind of activities that happen for different elements, okay, these processes, they're related between the carbon, the nitrogen, the phosphorus, the sulfur cycles. Okay? So it's, um, the thing that kind of links them together really is this, this production and decay of organic matter, okay? whether that's moving stuff out of the surface ocean into the deep ocean, or providing a source for these kind of atmospheric gases. Okay? Production and decay of organic matter is... Okay, so I think this is the last slide. So yeah, so these are the conclusions. Um, there are different, uh, basically carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, and sulfur cycles. Two of those have got really strong gaseous components. Um, two of them are really important, have a, much more important for the sedimentary components. But they all interact with each other. Okay. Um, the ultimate source of these nutrients is weathering, okay, um, or the kind of the volcanic gas production, okay, and um, without, if you run out of any one of these elements, life will stop, okay, so you absolutely need all of them to kind of sustain life, so uh, if you run out of one of the elements, that will stop life happening, which will then allow the other elements to kind of accumulate in the, in the local environment.